Growing up first generation in Toronto, difference was expected. A city with half its population composed of immigrants, I grew to understand diverse experiences not as a surplus, rather a norm. This sensibility translated to the ways in which I began to understand our built environment, a collection of spaces and instincts, shrugs and conversations, but ultimately, an evidentiary tool by which one can understand any which city as a set of fragments. My name is Khaled Hassan, and I'm a Master of Architecture candidate at Yale University's School of Architecture. With a background in environmental design, I've always thought of any architectural project as an interdisciplinary and therefore collective act. I've long been interested in how alternative knowledge bases, informal action, and unexpected traces of spatial thinking could act as a way to reconsider how we view architectural production. Architects need to be strategists that can manage complex inputs, but in order to make any lasting difference, I believe we must reconsider which inputs we prioritize. And so, when tasked with the design of a library in a flood-prone residential area in East Haven, Connecticut, I knew I had to look elsewhere for cues. When thinking about civicness and climate danger, I was naturally drawn to public infrastructure, the ways in which it could perform physically, but also its social, political, and ephemeral consequence. I was provoked by this precedent in which residents along the Mississippi River took infrastructure into their own hands by creating embankments that kept water out of their houses. The goal of my project is to see how this enclosure of an embankment as opposed to the linearity found in infrastructural levees, can be formalized through an architecture that's directly responsive to the needs of a library. The final output is a 33,000 square foot civic space along this flood-prone coast. With a continuous 10-foot tall foundation wall that wraps the building's enclosure, detailing for light became a priority. Carved columns with shaped faces funnel light into main gathering areas like the reading room. Similarly, a clear story that visually lifts the building brings levity to the experience of the space on the second floor, as seen in this event area. With most of the functional program nestled within an innermost volume, the question of how daylight would reach it remained. I developed a custom lighting detail that sought to lift a skylight grill over a bed of Titan fabric, diluting the sun for a continued luminance throughout the day. A half inch equals one foot study model and rendering exercise allowed for a testing of this strategy. Ultimately, this building is an inhabitable embankment that humanizes itself through the slippage of planes that enclose space but also let light in. Mass, therefore, is a suggestion, a mere guidebook by which slippage, layering, and delimitation become ways of imagining a civic library that needs to contend with a climatically difficult site. By carrying my experiences into a discipline that is proven to be exclusive, I want to help shift the collective imaginary of what civic-minded placemaking is and should be. Architects need to represent the public they serve and only then can the production of socially responsive buildings become a priority. Gensler, with its multidisciplinary outlook on spatial design, presents a unique testbed by which these issues can be brought to the fore. It's inspiring to see a firm of such stature put emphasis on difference as an asset and not a deficit. I hope to join this conversation and act as tangible proof for the profession that there is space for marginalized architects to control their narratives and create places that matter.